He became Australia's Time Lord through the discovery of a new period of geological time. He helped found two of the nation's major energy companies. He discovered massive undersea canyons off our coast. He became the first person to drive across one of our harshest deserts with his children in the back seat. And he set up one of the country's first and largest wilderness sanctuaries. His name was Reg Sprigg, and this is the story of his fascinating journey of discoveries. If you'd looked at a textbook a hundred years ago which described the history of the Earth, it would have told you that the oldest fossils of animals were found in Cambrian rocks. But everyone knew that there was a lot of geological time before the Cambrian, and they hypothesized that the earliest life must have been in the form of microbes, single-celled creatures, because without them we wouldn't have oxygen in the atmosphere, the stuff that we breathe. So we knew there had to have been life before the Cambrian, but no one had found any evidence of large-scale life. It was the long sought-after evidence of the ancestors of the things that left their fossil shells in the Cambrian period that Reg Sprigg was looking for. And he'd started when he was a student, as a student of the famous Antarctic explorer Sir Douglas Mawson, to look in the rocks of South Australia for the very earliest animal fossils. I think Sprigg thought that Mawson regarded him as the best student he ever had. In my opinion, would have been a rather brash, uh, precocious student. I would think that Reg uh, overrated what he thought the, the prof might have thought of him. He was also involved in Australia's first uranium hunt and production, but he was thought to be too radical. Security services banned him from involvement in the element that built the atomic bombs. I didn't really realise Reg was uh, suspect about his uh, background security for implications relating to radium fuel. In retrospect, I think it was over the top. If you associated with someone who was a suspect, then it seemed to rub off on you. If in doubt, keep them out. I think that was the point that the uh, security arrangements, uh, that's what they adopted. But there was another side to this. Recognising that we'd just come out of a war, we'd seen uh, an atomic bomb dropped. The Americans and the British were still engaged in uh, research of uranium. And I think it's naive for anybody to think that there wouldn't be restrictions on movement and activity. It was just part of, part of the business. For Red Sprig, there were other problems. Eminent scientists doubted that his discoveries of the Ediacara were anything at all. Red Sprig discovered the fossils here at Ediacara in 1946, and he published his results in the Transactions of the Royal Society in 1947 and 1949. And then there was almost a deafening silence. People accepted that these things probably were fossils, but they were really quite awestruck by them. They were not the kinds of fossils that people had expected, and these were not the kinds of rocks where normally one would have thought you could find fossils. Sprigg was describing soft-bodied creatures, things that to him looked like jellyfish and worms, preserved as impressions in sandstone. And sand isn't the right material to preserve soft-bodied creatures. I heard Sprigg at uh, public meetings uh, proclaiming his discovery of this enigmatic fossil uh, and with each telling, it evolved, and, uh, and it evolved from something that was pretty obscure and vague into something that was developing eyes and legs and flippers. And he would draw this thing on the board. Reg was uh, very deft with his uh, figuring, and he could draw these things. And the thing by this time was starting to look like something that he might have had for supper the previous evening. Reg Sprigg also took his science into his home. Dad was always keen that, that Dougie and I understood where things came from, you know, metals that um, 
Aluminium came from uh, bauxite and just little pebbly rocks and so on. And one time he brought home this sort of red dirt, um, sort of crushed up rock stuff. And he said, I'm going to show you um, about cinnabar and took us into the kitchen, got us up on a couple of chairs and we're looking over the top and he said, oh, you better stand back a weeny bit. Put, put this stuff in mum's best pot, turned on the, the heat on the um, hot plate and next thing, all these fumes start coming out. So of course, it, cinnabar is a, a rock that contains mercury and uh, the fumes were toxic that was filling the house. So throws open the window, races down the hall, throws open the front door. <laughs> Yeah, we found out where mercury comes from. After nearly half a century, the world acknowledged Sprigg's great Idiacara discovery. Red Sprigg had some difficulty in convincing his colleagues that these objects which he found here at Idiacara were actually animal fossils. But once he'd convinced Sir Douglas Mawson, Mawson realised that they needed a paleontologist and they employed an Austrian paleontologist, Professor Martin Glasner. Glasner wrote about the Ediacara in English, French, German and Russian scientific journals. The name Ediacara became well known to fossil scientists around the world. Then Scientific American published a paper about these strange creatures, which set a seal on his discovery. In the meantime, since Reg described these fossils, they have been found in Russia, they have been found in Canada, they have been found in England. They got the name Ediacaran only because they were first realised here. Geologists around the world had to agree on a name and a place. The beauty of this area that we're in, the National Park in the Flinders Ranges, preserves this sequence of rocks from the Cambrian back through time in perfect layers, just like pages of a book. And that's what you see around me. These are the pages of a very ancient book in one of the most important chapters in Earth history because this is the chapter where you should be looking to see the precursors of animal life.